Good evening, everybody. We are live tonight at lifechurch.tv. <laughs> we are in the heartland of America here at lifechurch.tv, and I'm so pleased that my friend Dave Ramsey asked me to participate in this event. You are in the right place if you're looking for hope, because over the last couple of years, over the last couple of decades, in fact, that's what Dave and his message have provided to all of you folks, to millions of people. Over four million tune into the Dave Ramsey Show on Radio Weekly to hear a message of hope. Millions of you have brought his books, have bought his books and attended his classes. You listen to him every week on Fox Business Network every night at 8 p.m. The Financial Peace University, of course, looking for hope. And over one million of you have now joined together tonight on radio, the Fox Business Network, and over 6,000 locations. It boggles the mind around the world to participate in this, one of the largest webcasts in history, looking for hope. Like I said, if you need some hope, if you need some answers, you've come to the right place. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. Without waiting one second more, let me introduce my friend, the man himself, the one and only Dave Ramsey. Wow. Woohoo! Yeah! Yes! Wow. You guys are awesome. Thank you. That's good. That stuff I That's enough. Do. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's good. Thank you guys, you're, you're awesome. You followed instructions on that standing ovation perfectly. <laughs> Excellent job, you guys. Thank you, seriously, we're so glad you're here tonight. For those of you at home and those of you across the nation, we're so glad that you're with us as well. We want to start out by saying thanks to the Fox Business Network. They, along with the folks at LifeChurch.tv and our team, have done an amazing job. Plus, many of you at these 6,000 locations across America have spent countless hours making sure that you could connect to this tonight. There has been a lot of time and a lot of effort by a lot of people to cause this to happen and uh, for me to get to stand here and look like I have a clue. And I'd like for you to give all of those people a round of applause right quick. Thank you. Because that's those tech guys, you know, that spent 24 hours, three days in a row up doing this kind of stuff. And they're the ones that did the real work, you know. I'm afraid if I'm not good at this, I'm going to get to go back to doing real work. So, uh, also, I want to tell you, we are broadcasting from Oklahoma City. We chose that for several reasons. One is our relationship with the pastor here, Craig Rochelle, at this church. He's a good friend of mine, and this is a great place to operate from. And I don't believe in coincidences, but I'll tell you an unintended thing that happened. We are doing this from Oklahoma City, talking about hope. 14 years ago this week was the Oklahoma City bombing. And so this is a community that has been scarred and yet has hope. I've walked among you for many years. I've come in here. You know about real hope. And I like, I like the idea of Oklahoma City. There's another reason we picked it out, honestly, was just a few hundred miles north of here is the actual geographical center of the United States of America. And I'm convinced the center of America is where hope really comes from. It probably doesn't come from Washington, D.C. <laughs> so, now, let's kind of begin to unpack this for a few minutes here together. For the last couple of decades, almost three decades, 25 to 30 years, America has had unprecedented prosperity. We have been doing really good. And as we say down south around Tennessee, we say things like, we kind of got fat and sassy. We kind of wasn't watching what we were doing. And you know, when you're a little bit prosperous, I know I am and I know you are, you get a little bit sloppy. And America got more than just a little bit sloppy. And when you're a little bit prosperous, you even get a little bit sloppy in your philosophy of life and your philosophy of handling money. Because, you know, stupid is not being stress test. It's not getting a stress test on stupidity. When, when things are going good, you can kind of cover it up if the economy is going good. You know, in other words, when things were going really good, any idiot could make it. You know, e e even, a, even a turkey can fly in a tornado, y'all. But now, stupidity has been 
officially stress tested. And the American family, while on this great vacation, had an amazing car wreck. And some of us walked away from the car wreck virtually unscathed. Some of us spent a night in the hospital. Some of us are in intensive care and some of us are in a coma. And it's struggling out there and people are hurting and they're scared and they're a little bit worried about cars. And so your ideas about money and about life have been tested. And some of them have come up, well, some of those ideas have come up lacking. They didn't work and they don't work. I've got a good friend that says often, he says, you know, when the tide goes out, you can tell who was skinny dipping. <laughs> and last, last fall, this thing went into crisis mode and it went crazy and everybody's kind of going nutso and, 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 you know, Wall Street it starts to have fear and starts to have a panic and it, and it passes it down to Washington and Washington goes into full-blown panic and they pass it off to the media and they go into hysteria. Sound like a beagle chasing a rabbit every time I turned on the news. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Scared me to death. Well, this was all going on, and I'm sitting there in Nashville doing my Fox Business show, doing my radio show, and so I'm kind of insulated from all of my friends that are these great anchors and great minds and things around New York that are in the media, and some of them are good friends, some of them are just acquaintances, but, you know, I'm watching them, and they're kind of having like this meltdown, some of them, right there on the television. And I'm going, guys, what are you so afraid about? I'm sitting here in Nashville. I know there's some foreclosures. I know there's some job layoffs. I know the stock market's down. But why are you in complete freakout mode? And I'm going on the air trying to tell people, stop, stop. I feel like that guy at the end of Animal House. You remember that? When the parade's coming and at the end of the parade, and he's like, stop. And they all run over him, you know? And that's kind of how I felt. I was like, no, it's okay. We're okay. We're okay. And then I had this weird experience. My friend Mike Huckabee started his show on the Fox News Network, and Mike, Mike called, and I was honored to be on the very first show that he did, and he called and asked if we would come up and do the show with him, and Geraldine Ferraro was going to be on there, and of course, we're talking about the economy, because the bailout package was right before Congress, and President Bush, and Paulson, and everybody's pushing this thing, so I went up there, and, and I go on the Mike Huckabee show, and we taped it in the morning, y'all probably don't, don't suppose to know that, it's not live, but, um, <laughs> And then they played it that night, you know, and, and as soon as I finished with the Huckabee show and talking to those people, and some of those people were kind of a little bit scared and all this, and I went across the hallway and I did Neil Cavuto's Saturday show with him, and I'm hanging out with Neil, and Neil's like, Dave, you think it's going to be okay? And turned the microphone off at the break. Dave, you think it's I said, Neil, you're smarter than me. You're way smarter than me. Why are you asking me stuff like this? And I could just kind of feel it in the air. And we went across the street from the Fox there in the corner there in Manhattan. There's a real nice steakhouse. And my wife and I and another couple were having, having dinner there sitting across the street from Fox. And there's this about nine foot or whatever red ticker tape thing that runs along the side of the building with the latest news. If you ever visit, you'll see that up there. And along the side it says, gold sellers can't find enough gold. People are buying it too fast. Stock market plunges. Unemployment goes up. And I'm watching all this bad news scroll down. And I had a weird experience. Fear suddenly just melted over me and it ran down my spine and my stomach knotted up. And I suddenly started thinking to myself, I wonder if all of this thing where I'm saying it's okay, I wonder, and I'm the only one hardly saying it, I wonder if I'm wrong. I wonder if we're going to lose everything. I wonder if the whole economy is just going to implode and we're going to have a whole different government or something. I wonder how, and I started wondering these really weird, crazy fear thoughts. And I didn't say anything to mess up anybody's dinner. And we went out from there and then we went back to the hotel room. And I started talking to my wife and I said, Sharon, this is, this, this, I might be wrong. We could, we could lose everything. And she's like, who are you and what you do with my husband? <laughs> you know? And honestly, we stood there and talked about it a minute and it suddenly hit me that as a Christian, as a person of faith, I probably knew what was going on. I had encountered a spirit of fear. And I began to pray, honestly. Now, some of you, that freaks you out, but I talked to my dad, and it doesn't freak me out. And the fear left, and honestly, I got to... And I'm not bragging on me, but i got to tell you, the fear left me at that moment, and I hadn't been afraid about this thing since. Because fear is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not how things work. 
And so as I looked at that, I started realizing why my friends, some of them were melting down and others of them were not. And it wasn't necessarily a faith thing, but it's whether or not they had taken fear in. And fear is the antithesis of what we're talking about. It's the antithesis of hope. And so the Bush White House and Paulson, they decide to bail out stupidity. And they pass trillions of dollars of deficits and put our grandkids deeply in debt to bail out stupidity. And then we get a new administration and they decide they're going to stimulate stupidity. <laughs> so as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of government interference in the marketplace. I kind of think I'm kind of an old-fashioned dude. I kind of think let the chips fall where they fall. And this is how the deal happens. And, and I work my way into this. And I'm on these shows nowadays, and I'm talking about, hey, government interference and government bailouts are probably not the best idea. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they're a dumb idea. And I'm talking about this over and over and over again. That's OK. There's lots of people that don't agree with you and me. And we were on, I was on Good Morning America one morning, and I love doing that show. They're so nice to me, Diane and Robin, and, and honestly, the crew behind the scenes, I've become good friends with them. I just enjoy going up there, and I enjoy talking to them. They do such a great job. And I was on there with a couple of other financial people, both of which, and this is kind of rare for me, but I actually found two people that are financially that I somewhat agree with. And, and so uh, we had two other financial goobs on there with me, and it was like the financial goob panel thing, you know? And, <laughs> And, and they came up, and, and these two are two people who I really respect their intellect, and I respect their sincerity. And, and one of them, as we were talking about this government thing, and she, she turned to me and she said, Dave, everybody knows that the government is going to have to help turn this around. And the other guy looked at me and he said, most economists agree, Dave, that we have to have government involvement to bring this around. And it occurred to me, I'm reading a different book than they're reading. I'm thinking differently than they're thinking. What is going on? Why do they honestly, with sincerity, believe that? And they're intelligent and bright people and sincere people. And, and yet, I just, I'm perpendicular with them and I don't think that. What is wrong with that? And I kind of had to go back and thought process how I learned about economics and go through those things. So let me kind of take you on a little journey, if you will. Cambridge in England, in 1905, a young man graduates in mathematics. Now, if you think back just a little bit in general history, you'll know that England at that point was coming from being run by kings and queens, a monarchy, and being owned by kings and queens, moving towards capitalism slash socialism mix, whatever it is they've got now. And they were passing through along that spectrum, and at that time were dead in the middle of what you and I today would call socialism. So this young man was trained and grew up in Cambridge in the middle of that. Let's fast forward from 1905, a few years, and now he has become one of the leading economists in Europe, and he comes to the States in 1934 in the throes of the Depression, the Great Depression, and he goes into the office, the Oval Office. Walk into the Oval Office with me right now, if you will. And he goes and he sits down with one of our greatest presidents in history, FDR. And he sits down with him in 1934, and he says, President Roosevelt, this is how you can fix the economy, and he begins to unpack his theory of economics. Roosevelt didn't bite for four years. By 1938, though, Roosevelt bought the ideas and wove the ideas, and here are the ideas. Here's the basic tenets of this young man, now an older man's, ideas on economics. He says that full employment can be maintained. Full employment can be maintained only with government spending. These are the principles of his economic theory. Government must invest in public works and must hire the unemployed. These are the tenets, and here's the biggie. Government has to run deficit spending in a slowing economy. Now, deficit spending simply means the government is spending more than it brings in and runs up debt. So this man, we could call him the father of deficit spending, was the co-author, if you will, of the New Deal. His name was John Maynard Keynes, and he was the author of what we in economics call Keynesian economics. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of this, but fast forward a few more years, and the Great Depression is ending, and we're at 1944, and unemployment has gone from 25 and 17 percent down to 1 percent in 1944. 
And the output, the gross domestic product of the United States has gone from very, very bad to double, almost triple. So 1944 is a boom year, and the New Deal and Keynesian economics is the new star on the horizon. This has brought us out of the Great Depression. And this is what we are taught in textbooks today when you take economics in the average university in America. It's what I was taught. It's what my two friends sitting on the couch with me at Good Morning America were taught, that this is why it works. And here's the flaw. They forgot to do an overlay of history. December 7th, 1941 was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I just gave you statistics from 1944, three years later. There was a reason there was 1% unemployment. All the men were in the military fighting and the women were in factories building tanks. That's what was going on. There was a reason that government spending was working. It wasn't working. It got credit for what World War II did. And so when you hear most economists, just remember most economists were trained in academia today, and in academia today, Keynes is a superstar. However, a few years ago, there was a guy who came along and won a Nobel Prize for challenging his ideas. He's the modern father of capitalism. His name is Milton Friedman. Now, Milton Friedman began to challenge these ideas and say they're wrong. And see, that's what I'm doing in a sense tonight, because I believe that you can be sincere and you can still be wrong. You can have a good heart and want to help people, and you could do it in a stupid way. It happened to me one time. How many of you have ever done something stupid? Raise your hand. <laughs> how, how many of you that didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? <laughs> We've all done something stupid. I was 22 years old. I got out of college, and I went to work for this propane company. And they had this wonderful new invention that they had not done very good research and development on. It was about this big. It was called the Daisy Diesel Booster. It was invented by this wonderful man who knew a lot about that kind of thing, and I was enthusiastic about it because the idea was that they would shoot a little bit of propane through this thing and control it into the diesel engine, making the diesel engine run more efficient and get better gas mileage. Now, if you can take a fleet of trucks and make them get better gas mileage, you can increase profits. This thing is huge. So I call up a family friend that I had known all my life and my parents knew before I was even born, and I said, he owns all these quarries with those great, huge uke trucks to carry rocks in. You know, the ones the size of a house. You all know what I'm talking about. Say yes. yes. And I took those little daisy diesel bushes over there and I said, this is going to save you guys a bunch of money. And we put those on his trucks, and you know that those little things blew those trucks up? <laughs> You can be sincere and still be stupid. <laughs> and you need to keep this in mind as we go forward. Milton Friedman said the Great Depression was produced by government mismanagement rather than by an inherent instability of the private economy. History suggests that capitalism is a necessary condition for political freedom. So economically, as we discuss hope tonight, Economically speaking, what is the source of our hope? Well, I'm a believer in capitalism. But now I'm not a believer, no, I'm not a believer in the capitalism that we've been seeing of late in some places. We've seen an abuse of capitalism. Michael Novak said it well. He said, our economy rests on a three-legged stool. Political freedom, economic freedom, and get this one, moral restraint. Those of us that are in business are called to serve our customers, not milk them like a cow. We're supposed to take care of them. We need, again, a capitalism that has a value system that cares about its employees, a value system that cares about its customers. And that's what works. Gandhi said it. He, he said commerce without morality will destroy us. And that's what we've been having in some parts of our culture. And it's given the rest of us that run a business right a bad name. And people have said, now, all business is evil. All business is not evil. I, I can tell you the guy that fixes my hot water heater when it goes out, I'm really glad that plumber knows how to serve. I like a shower, and it gets bad around our place if I don't get one. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson said, doing well is the result of doing good. That's what capitalism is all about. Kenneth Blanchard says, business is like tennis. Those who serve well win. And my friend Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, has a wonderful saying. He says, when you, when you do really good with your money, and you do really good with your business, and you go serve a customer well, kind of like a waiter serving you at a table, 
When you serve customers well, when you write a book that helps someone and touches their lives, when you put on a network that touches people and helps them, when, when, when you put in a hot water heater for a guy that needs a shower, when you serve customers well, they give you certificates of appreciation. <laughs> Profit is the applause that your customer gives you. If you open up a restaurant and the food's cold and the service is bad and the prices are high, you're going to close and I say good. You should close. We shouldn't bail you out. You're freaking lame. <laughs> and we have some very sincere and kind-hearted people in America today. And they're very sweet people, and I meet them, and I disagree with them, and I still love them, and some of them have become good friends of mine. But they have this idea that no one should ever have pain. And that is a wonderful idea. I work with hurting people, and I don't want anybody to ever have pain. I'm a daddy. I got three kids. They're grown, and I don't want any of them to have pain. But the truth is, grown-ups, you're grown-ups. You're not children. You don't need a keeper. You don't need a caretaker. You need to learn to accept that this is how life works, and sometimes life's not fair. It's not. Sometimes it hurts, and sometimes it's scary, and those are realities. But we've got to go back to some basics in this country again. And one of those things we need to go back to is this. We desperately need to love people enough to allow them to fail. We need to allow failure. Failure's good. Failure is instructive. Failure brings clarity. Failure's cleansing and it's corrective. And failure, if it's chasing you, will run you towards excellence. <laughs> if, if there's no chance if there's no chance that you can fail, you have no reason to be your best. If there's no chance that you could lose your job due to dull, mediocre, cruddy performance, then why would you work? You say, take it easy, and you mean it. <laughs> why? Failure needs to be an option. A little desperation is good for the soul. That's why when we've got folks on our team in marketing that have straight commission, I had one of them come in the other day and he said, you know, I need a little higher base. And I said, no, you need to make some more sales. I said, dude, your raise is effective when you are. <laughs> See, I failed. I started with nothing and I became a millionaire by the time I was 26 years old and I did it stupid. I borrowed too much money and I lost everything I owned. I almost lost my marriage and my sanity, and I did lose my hair. <laughs> but I figured out what my friend John Maxwell says. He wrote a book called Failing Forward, that success is merely a pile of failures that you're standing on. We have to allow failure again. The Bible says rejoice in your suffering because suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, and hope is a gift of the Holy Spirit. If you talk to successful people in anything, you will find, you ask them, what's the number one character quality of successful people? They will tell you perseverance. Rejoice in your suffering because suffering produces perseverance. But Dave, I, I, I'm afraid I don't want anybody to hurt. And, and if you get rich, that means someone else isn't going to get anything. That's not fair. Well, no, that, that's, a, that's a wrong view of the economy. Again, my friend Rabbi Daniel Lappin in the book Thou Shalt Prosper says, the economy is not a cake, that if I take a bigger slice, you automatically by default have a smaller slice. That's not how the economy works. It is not finite. It is not limited. It is ever fluid, ever expanding. The economy is more akin to candles. If I take my candle and I light your candle, I was not diminished. I didn't end up with less and you got light. He waited on me and fixed my hot water heater. I gave him some certificates of appreciation. He goes over and buys lunch at the local market and he gives them some of those certificates of appreciation and the economy expands. We light each other's candles until the whole room is lit. And that's how capitalism really, really works. We need to reintroduce something else into this culture and that's the ancient word. You're no longer allowed to say this word. It's been removed from the dictionary. 
It is, it is politically incorrect to say this word. You're not allowed to say this to your spouse. You're not allowed to say this to your parishioners if you are a pastor. You can never tell anyone this. You can't tell any people group this. You certainly can't tell your children this in our modern culture. This is a word that has left, and we need to desperately reintroduce this word. I'm going to reteach it to you because some of you haven't heard it in years. It's a little short word, but it's very powerful because it will set you free. The word is... No. You, you press the tongue, your tongue towards the roof of your mouth, make a kissing motion with your lips, blow air past and release. It sounds like this. No. Say it with me. No. No. You're 16. You can't have a new Corvette. You're incompetent. You get a 94 Chevette. No. No, you'll kill yourself in that thing, and I'm a loving father, and I don't care if you don't like it. The answer is no. No, you can't buy a house. You're freaking broke. You're going to lose the house. No. And we're not going to securitize all of this stupidity and sell it on Wall Street to hedge funds either. No. No, you can't rip me off anymore. I will no longer do business with your company or anyone that looks or smells like you. No. No, no, it's a powerful thing. No, you can't buy this house. When broke people buy houses, you know what they get? They get broker. That's why they call them real estate brokers. <laughs> and lastly, there's this. If we're going to retake this country for you and I, we the people be the healing agent and the place that hope comes from. And we are the place that hope comes from, economically speaking then there's another thing we need to do. We need to go back to taking personal responsibility. You need to clean up your own mess. You need to take care of your own house. You need to feed your kids. And you need to work whatever that means. You need to get after it. You need to cause some things to happen. Personal responsibility. My dad used to say, you shot it, Tarzan, you eat it. <laughs> Turns out McDonald's does serve hot coffee. And you were just a klutz and spilled it, and that ain't anybody's fault, but you're shut up and be more careful next time. Well, they superheated their coffee. They deserve to be sued into oblivion. No, they don't. You're a klutz, and you're rationalizing. Stop it. Take responsibility for your mess. When I went broke, I spent about six months whining. Have you ever whined? I thought it was a little known form of prayer. <laughs> and I sat around blaming the banks and blaming the IRS and blaming whoever I could blame. And one of my friends sat down at me over a cup of coffee and he said, you know whose fault it was? I said, whose? I need somebody else to blame. <laughs> he said, it's your fault. And he said, son, if you keep holding on to those lemons, you're never going to get any lemonade. Quit hanging on to your lemons. Let go. Take responsibility that you caused this mess. Yes, there were some things done to you, but you set it up where they could be. Your shields will be better next time. You'll be wiser. Learn your lessons and keep going. It's your fault. Around our place, we have a saying. We say, work like it all depends on us. Pray like it all depends on God. We take responsibility for pulling this off tonight. We worked with Fox. We worked with the Life Church people, and we all three took responsibility for pulling this off tonight. And sometimes some of my friends that are out there in Christianity, they, I, I believe in prayer, but sometimes Christians' prayer is code for I don't want to face reality. Sometimes prayer is code for I'm just going to sit back and do nothing, watch Oprah reruns and hope my life fixes itself. You can pray while you're working. I love the story Earl Nightingale used to tell, great motivator. He said there was a preacher walking along the country lane, beautiful country lane. He came across the top of the rise, and below him, as far as he could see, was this gorgeous farm. The rows in the farm were perfectly laid out. 
There was not a weed in this thing. The fence rows were clean. Everything was nice. And as he kept walking, the little house began to come into view. And he could see the little house there. And you can see it in your mind. It looked like a Norman Rockwell painting. I mean, the, the picket fence is white and clean. The bushes are trimmed. Everything looks just right. And, and as the preacher comes up to the end of the row, the farmer's coming out the end of the row working. He's got sweat and dirt dripping off of him with his overalls. And the pastor says, Farmer? He said, Yes, sir. He said, God has blessed you with a beautiful farm. And the old farmer leans back and he says, yes, sir, he has. And I got to tell you, I tell him every morning I'm grateful for it. But you should have seen it when he had it all to himself. <laughs> Woven into our faith, into our Judeo-Christian ethic, which is the fabric of this great land, whether you participate in those or not, woven into that fabric is this idea of personal responsibility. The Bible says the diligent prosper. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about some of the things that people across America want to talk about. We're going to take calls by Twitter. We're going to take calls by Facebook. We're going to take uh, calls uh, by, by text. I can't even name all the ways. Some of it's so cool, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Email, phone calls. Some of you in this audience are going to ask questions, and we're going to talk about the economic situation. And I'm here to help you and serve you, and we're going to talk about Hope Night tonight. My friend David Asman is going to help us with that. He's kind of our MC tonight, and he's going to walk us through the different questions. And our team back here across the, the top, the town hall uh, board or whatever we call this thing back here with all this media coming in, they're taking the calls and the questions and all the interaction from the Internet, and David is going to feed those to me throughout the night. So, David, I turn it over to you, sir. We're, we're calling this Mission Control, by the way, because we're all control. on a mission here. So this is our Mission Control crew. But first, we got an email here from, and I swear I didn't have anything to do with this, New York City, my hometown. Dan from New York City sent an email saying, is this, it's a two-part question, is this our generation's Great Depression, our generation's Great Depression, and what are some of the differences between now and then? Well, that's a good question. It gives me a chance to talk about a couple of things. One is, I hope that this is this generation's Great Depression, in the sense that the children of the Great Depression were permanently changed and were more responsible with money from then on. So in that sense, I hope it is. How many of you have like, were, are like me? You were working in the backyard with your grandpa and you pull a nail out of a board and you'd straighten that nail out and put it in a can when you're working with grandpa. I mean, that, that's, a different, that's a different generation. And so in that sense, I hope, in a, I hope we've gleaned something from the pain and the fear and the scare that we've had. Is it the Great Depression? And I've heard political people say, this is, the, this is the worst since the Great Depression. This is as bad as the Great Depression. I've heard media and political people on both sides of the aisle make these ridiculous statements. In every case, either because they're in a freaking hysterical panic themselves or because they've got an agenda and they're trying to pass something and want you and I to be scared enough to allow them to do it. I don't know which it is, but they're out there pitching that this is the Great Depression. This is nowhere near like the Great Depression. As a matter of fact, it's not even the worst recession since the Great Depression. How's that? Let me walk you through a couple of numbers. The Great Depression, unemployment was 25%, and there were real bread lines, not people with Gulf streams lined up at Congress. Okay? The real depression, the market dropped 89%. The stock market lost 90% of its value. Okay? We've lost 57% right now, just to kind of give you an idea. 1973-74, with an energy crisis and a president and a, and a vice president resigning in shame, the market dropped almost as much as it's dropped now. It dropped 50%, and it took it 61 months to recover, five years and one month before it came back. And we had inflation of 11%. We don't have inflation of 11%. And we had gas lines around the block. Anybody remember the 70s? Yeah. 1982, we had another great recession coming out of the Carter administration straight into the, uh, the Reagan administration coming in. Inflation was not non-existent, which it is right now. It may come back if we keep borrowing money at this rate. But inflation was not non-existent. It was between 10 and 13 percent in those years. Huge inflation. Stuff would double in cost in a matter of weeks, it seemed like. 
And I was in the real estate business in those days. It was scary how fast houses were going up. They were going up thousands of dollars a month. Interest rates, if you recall, in 1982, fixed rate interest on a mortgage was 17%. The market dropped about 29% in those days, not as far as it's dropped now, as far as the stock market goes. But today, we're not sitting on, oh, and by, by the way, unemployment was over 10% in 1982. Unemployment right now is 8.5%. We currently have an 8.5% unemployment rate. We have mortgage rates of 4 and 3 eighths on a 15 year with paying one point. That's pretty amazing. We have no inflation and we currently do not have an energy crisis. Okay? So this is not even as bad as 82 or 74, albeit bad, because there's a saying about unemployment statistics. You're either 100% employed or 100% unemployed. You don't really care about eight and a half percent. And yet 47% of Americans surveyed last month said they were afraid they were going to lose their jobs. We were at five and a half percent unemployment before this started. So 3% of Americans have lost their jobs and half of them are afraid. Now what's that coming from? That's coming from fear, which is the antithesis of hope. It obviously does not represent reality. Their fear is false evidence appearing real. And that's what we're trying to combat tonight. So some of you may lose a job yet. That may be a reality. But this is not even the worst recession since the Great Depression. Does that make it any easier for you if you're hurting? No, it doesn't. But I'm trying to combat on a scope like this, this idea that the world's coming to an end and we've got to stop the hysteria because that's making it worse. Everybody freaking out is making it worse. All right, David, what we got next? Well, we got a newfangled machine. It's called a telephone. I don't know if you heard about it, but <laughs> we have Laura handling telephones. We got a call from Jennifer from Little Rock, Arkansas. All right, Jennifer. Hi, Dave. My question is, because the nation's economy is based increasingly on debt, I have serious hesitations about continuing to invest in the stock market, even though economic wisdom says in the long run things will turn up again. What other options do I have for investing? Okay, that's a really good question. A lot of people are worried about their 401ks, because if you looked up, notice a lot of them look like a 201k. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it, you look at your statements and it's gone down and we're struggling. Mine's gone down too. I've got a lot of money in mutual funds and I look and it's down. A and so what do I invest in? And she said an interesting phrase. She said, even though wisdom suggests that long term it's going to be okay, but I've got this fear. Do you hear what's going on in people's minds? This is what's run rampant through the land. And I'm not picking on her. She's just a perfect metaphor for everything we're dealing with tonight. Here are some statistical basics for you that you need to understand. Number one, 100% of the 15-year periods in the stock market's history have made money. And, and so this young man sitting back here who's in his 20s, this guy sitting over here who's in his 30s, the even old guys like me who I'm 48, 15 years I'll be in my 60s. So what? I don't need the money till then. 100% of the 15-year periods in the stock market's history have made money. The stock market is artificially low right now. There's no mathematical support for how low it is. It has been driven by fear. And it's come back, and did you notice all the headlines? It's kind of interesting to me that the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the last seven weeks has come up 22%. Somewhere in the 20s. I mean, depending on what it did today, I didn't look at it. But, you know, 65.94 was the low on March the 9th and it's hovering up around 8,000 right now. Have you seen any newspaper headlines that say, Dow Jones Industrial Average returned 20% plus in the last seven weeks? And if you annualize that, that's like a lot of money. <laughs> Not one person is reporting that or talking about it, except me, and I'm trying to calm people down. And I was on a talk show the other day, and the guy said, well, last fall you were telling us, you know, not to sell, and look where it is, it's even lower than it was last fall. And I said, I was telling you not to sell, but I wasn't telling you not to sell because of spring. I was telling you not to sell from 10, 15-year viewpoint. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And when you only look to Friday afternoon, when you live your life, thank God it's Friday, oh God, it's Monday, and you do your investing that way, when you do your investing that way, you're going to be broke your whole life because you're going to live in a panic and you're going to put it in at the wrong time and take it out at the wrong time. You're going to try to time the market. Patience during a recession is a major thing. The S&P 500 since 1974, when it went down, dropped 50-something percent on the Nixon and Agnew resignation. Since 1974, the S&P 500, which is a measure of the stock market, has returned 1,250 percent through today. 
That's a 1,200 percent return since 1974. Now, so I personally am continuing to invest because I believe that Home Depot, that McDonald's, I, I believe that Coca-Cola and Microsoft, I believe that Dell and these other publicly traded companies, are all of those I named going to be perfect? Absolutely not. I believe that Walmart and other excellent companies around America 15 years from now as a group are going to be worth more than they are now. If you don't believe that, then you pretty much have given up on the economy because those are the best and brightest companies out there right now and what they trade on over the period of years is do you really believe they're worth half what they were this time last year? No, well they were artificially inflated. Nope, they really weren't. They were, they were giving returns based on the profits that they were creating. They're creating less profit right now so they are worth less. But do you think that they're worth half of what they were? I don't. I think it's artificially driven low by fear. So I'm continuing to invest in the stock market and I'm continuing to invest in real estate. In other words, if you have a 15 year perspective and you realize that the stock market is really at an all time low in your lifetime for most of you, you're at Kmart, honey, and the blue light's on. All right, David. From old tech, we're going to new to the newest tech, the Twitter technology. I still haven't figured out how to use it. This is Chris, our Twitter guy, and this Twitter comes from GB Slaw from Tennessee. He says, bought my home in May 07, right before the bottom fell out. When can I expect the value of my home to rebound to the original price? Well, I, I don't know. I'm convinced that economic forecasters are there to give weather forecasters credibility. So I, I honestly, truthfully, don't know. He who lives by the crystal ball eats glass, right? But I, I really don't know. But I, my opinion is, and it's probably worth exactly what you paid for it. This was a free event. And um, <laughs> my opinion is that housing will probably lead us out of this recession. It will probably not be the stock market, and it will probably not be jobs. I think the stock market and jobs will come back as the, mark, as, the, as the economy starts moving and housing will lead us out. And here's why I believe that, four and three-eighths percent interest rates, for one thing. We're at a 50-year low on interest rates. It is an absolute fabulous time to buy a house and they're on sale everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it is the best time to buy a house in I don't know when. It's absolutely incredible. Now the second thing, the reason I think that is, I had an experience when I got in the real estate business in uh, coming out of college in 1982. Now if you remember 1982, we were talking about it a minute ago. Interest rates had gone through 17 and a half percent was the actual peak on a fixed rate mortgage. Some of you are old enough like I am to remember that. And if you can imagine what happened to house, house sales when interest rates were 15, 16, 17 percent. Frozen like a deer in the headlights, right? Now I started selling houses in 1984 following that in this subdivision, a high-end expensive subdivision, not super high-end, but upper middle class. We had some nice models and we had 14% fixed rate coming down. It was coming down out of that ridiculous stuff we were in. We had cars lined up around the block and I sold 78 houses myself that year at 14% fixed rates. Now why did that happen? Because a certain number of people are going to move every month for one reason or another. They're going to die, they're going to sell, they're going to move, they're going to be transferred, and when they're frozen because of the economy and they're scared, like they have been, then all of the, 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 the water's backing up behind the dam. In economics we call that pent-up demand. And then all of a sudden what happens is the, something happens and the fear breaks loose and the dam opens and it floods. So there's all these people for the past six months that have not been buying houses and they're suddenly going to hit the market at some point. And that's going to give this thing this oomph, clear, to, to get the thing going, right? And, and, and the other thing that's going to happen is this, the inventory that's there, the used housing inventory, we sold 4.7 million houses last month in the month, of, or in the month of February. That's the numbers, okay? And, and foreclosures are everywhere, the world's coming to an end, foreclosures and statistics are awful, foreclosures, shut up, listen, 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 stop. <laughs> listen. I pulled the foreclosure statistics and looked at them myself. Here's some numbers. 60% of the foreclosures occurred in five states. 40% of the foreclosures occurred over the whole other 45 states. There's some problem areas, in other words. 35 counties represent 50% of the foreclosures. 
So understand, foreclosures are very localized. Are they up in your city? They're probably up in your city. But, but listen, if you're in Las Vegas or you're in Phoenix or you're in California or Florida or Michigan, your foreclosures are up. The rest of you, they're up, but not like panic time. But the market still froze because everybody's been watching the news and everybody said the world's coming to an end. I mean, I got a friend who watches CNN and Fox all day long. We're going to have to put the boy in a rubber room. <laughs> he needs to just watch Fox, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. So here's the point, though. Here's what happens. When you build a house, it costs a certain amount to build a house. That's called cost of goods sold. I mean, the, nail, the price of nails have not gone down. The price of shingles have not gone down. Price of labor's gone down a little bit because people are looking for work, all right? But it's not gone down dramatically. Lumber's not in half, okay? It costs almost as much to build a house right now as it did a year ago. So when that used inventory burns off and we're left with only new housing, prices have to come up closer to new housing because that's what new housing's gonna cost and it's gonna be in the mix again for competitiveness. So what you've got is new housing here lifting and elevating used housing as the inventory burns off. So some of these price dips in some of these markets is very temporary because again, it's driven by fear. It is the best time to buy some houses. I got a friend buying all over Florida like crazy. He's worth about $20 million and he's buying everything he can get his hands on in Florida because he, think Flor he thinks Florida's gonna come back so fast that it's gonna be a whiplash. So real estate's gonna be fine. And it's the best time in 15 years, to, or in 30 years to buy a house. But, don't buy a house if you're broke. <laughs> okay? Make sure you got your emergency fund in place, three to six months of expenses, make sure you're out of debt. And then when you buy a house, that house is a blessing. And Murphy doesn't move in your spare bedroom and bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. <laughs> David? We're right over here in the audience, Kathy Conan from Edmond, Oklahoma. Good to see you, Kathy. Thank you. In 2007, my son was born, and I also went through a divorce. Um, so I had to quit my job in order to afford to finish my degree, and the greatest blessing came from that, and God gave me the ability to pay off $12,000 worth of debt. All right. So next year, hopefully, I will graduate. <laughs> And um, I'll be near 30, and I have not even begun to think about retirement or future educational costs for my son, who's now two. Okay. So where to start and who to trust? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, let me first tell you, you're an absolute warrior. I'm so proud of you. You not only have gone back to school, you took charge of your life. You're thinking into the future about you and your son. You're, you're epitomizing the personal responsibility that we've been talking about tonight. You're the reason that America's gonna be okay and people like you. I'm very proud of you. So you're way on track. 52% of the single moms live below the poverty level in America today. So you wanna help somebody, by the way? There's somebody you could help as a single mom. Now, now, what would be the order of attack? Well, the order of attack would be our baby steps that we talk about in the book, The Total Money Makeover. We'll, sure, we'll make sure you get one before you leave tonight. Now, baby steps are this. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to get $1,000 cash in the bank as fast as you can. Then we're going to work our way out at whatever remaining debt there is. That's baby step two. Three is finish your emergency fund. And then you've laid the foundation to begin to do your investing. And that's retirement. You can do a Roth IRA for you and a good growth stock mutual fund. Uh, you see one of our endorsed local providers to do that. They'll sit down with the heart of a teacher. You asked who to trust? You've got good instincts. I can tell by the way you've operated your life. Trust your instincts. When you sit down with a financial person, if you feel like you're being sold, get up and leave. 85% of the financial people are taught how to sell and not what to sell. 15% of them have the heart of a teacher. So if you're with a mortgage person, an insurance person, an investment person, a real estate person, a, a tax person, and they get an attitude and they're trying to talk down, leave. Get out of there. You want someone who has the heart of a teacher. And you can tell they have the heart of a teacher if you get taught. So learn about investments, learn about the Roth IRA, learn about the educational savings account, and we'll get that two-year-old in college. And I'll give you a prediction. 10 years from today, you're gonna be killing it.
Dave, if you can look up at the monitors there, we got a YouTuber calling okay. in, a video call in. Go ahead. All right. Hi, Dave. Chris in Indianapolis here, and I have a question about my bank. Um, with small banks being taken over by big banks and uh, all the big banks uh, on the verge of going out of business, it seems, how do I know my money is safe where it is and should I move it somewhere else? Thanks for all you do. Bye. <laughs> Gotta love YouTube. It's made, it's made everybody a star. You know, it's great. And I'm a star in things on there I didn't intend to be a star in. Um, <laughs> well, here's the deal. I don't do business with big banks because they have no soul. I, I do business with a small local community bank and your local credit unions because I can still find somebody in there and get my hands around their neck. You know what I'm saying? And, and the good credit unions have the NCUA, uh, which is the FDIC of credit unions, and of course the FDIC now covers you for $250,000. Even if you're dealing with one of these big banks, it's owned and run by the government now, and don't kid yourself, okay? Uh, when the president starts firing CEOs, we know who's running things, all right? So we know what's going on. So don't kid yourself about that. So I don't have any money in Bank of America. I don't have any money in Citibank. You can if you want to, but I don't play with those boys. I got my little local hometown bank that still uses their brain. And you know what? They're more safe than the big banks because they didn't play in the subprime stuff. They were still using their brain. They had a little bit more anyway. They were a little bit more responsible, but they're not as unstable financially. Now, if they get gobbled up, I had one of them I was dealing with. I deal with several banks, but I want them to get gobbled up by one of the big banks and I jerk my business out of there. I'm not going in with that play. Not because I'm worried about them closing, but because I know the level of service I'm going to get, I'm immediately going to be a digit. And I don't want to be a digit. I like to see human beings on the other end of this. I don't mind paying people to serve me, but I want to see some people. Our receptionist still answers our phone at our office. You're not going to get a recording. We have, her title is she's the director of first impressions. <laughs> All right, David, what's up? Right, we got something live coming in here. This is Jazz. He's in charge of the text messages. And here's one, Dave. With all the money going into circulation, I add the trillions going into circulation, what do we do with our savings? Huge inflation is coming, right? Well, the end of the world has been predicted for years. Um, and, and I think inflation probably is coming if we don't get co uh, Congress to slow down. I mean, a drunken congressman can make a sailor look crazy on spending. I mean, it's, they're amazing. I mean, they absolutely are out of control up there. And so if they don't quit doing this, we are going to see some inflation because they're burning money is what it amounts to. And when you flood anything into the market, then it becomes worth less. You know, the reason that everybody wants a, like one of those Wii Nintendo thingies at Christmas is because nobody can get one. And money works exactly the same way. A shortage of it makes it more valuable. And, a, you know, it's spread out everywhere makes it less valuable, thus inflation. And so we will likely see some inflation if we don't stop these trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. Is it going to break us? No, I don't think our economy is fragile enough overall, over the scope of time, for the government to fix it or to ruin it. And, and so I think we're going to be okay. Now, if you're worried about inflation, here's what you invest in. Things that go up as inflation goes up. And that would be good growth stock mutual funds and companies that make the things that are going to go up in value. Thus, your profit's going to go up. How about real estate? Major component of inflation. Houses go up rapidly. I talked about that back in the 70s when houses were going up 1% a month, 12% a year. So, you know, like a $100,000 house, one month later is worth 110. The next month it's worth 121. That's how fast it was going. All right? And that's two months in, you made 21 grand. That's inflation. And if you own that house, you got to hedge against inflation because you're riding the wave up. And so what you do if you fear inflation is you buy good growth stock mutual funds and real estate. Pay for it. Don't bet on inflation to bail you out. That's the definition of how to go bankrupt. All right. So, but, but the concept here is ride the inflationary things and you'll be just fine. It's kind of common sense if you think it through. All right, David, who's up? Well, this is kind of related to the last question because it's talking about inflation. Want to hedge it against inflation. This, by the way, is, is uh, from Becky, and it's via Facebook. She says, I'm wondering if with recent developments, you still say not to buy gold. <laughs> gold. Everybody's talking about gold. I think gold is the Snuggie of investments. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, what, I, what I mean is this. If you, it's sold on Midnight Cable, and if you buy it, it'll make you look stupid. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, here's the statistical evidence on gold. Here's the real gold story, okay? I don't own any gold, and I'm not going to buy any gold, and here's why. It's a crummy investment. It's awful. Gold over from 19, from, or sorry, I'm sorry, from 1833, that's a ways back, to the year 2001, gold has averaged 1.54% a year. From 2001 to now, it's made 15% a year. All right? Now, I had some mutual funds in the late 90s that were buying dot-com companies, tech companies. I had one mutual fund made 105% in one year. The next year, it lost all of that <laughs> because those dot-com companies burst. You know what I'm talking about. Does anybody remember the late 90s? Shot way up, and then it went right back down. Gold is very, 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 very volatile. But Dave, gold is what everyone will go to if the economy fails. It's the medium of exchange, and this whole thing is going bad, Dave. We're going to need gold. Well, really? Okay, let's kind of talk that through for a minute, because a lot of people actually believe that. But here's the faulty thing in that. Again, that's one of those myth things that are passed around by the gold salesman. It's a myth because gold has not been used as a medium of exchange in a failed economy since the Roman Empire. Here's what happens in a failed economy. Let me give you an example of a failed economy. New Orleans after Katrina. Not picking on New Orleans, but let me tell you what happened after New Orleans. Nobody's, I mean, after Katrina hit New Orleans, nobody's walking around with a little bag of gold. Okay? And they weren't even walking around with paper money. But you could trade a bottle of water or a can of gasoline for about anything down there for a few weeks, couldn't you? And some housing or a tarp to cover something. Goods and services are what become valuable in a completely decimated economy. And a barter-based economy starts pulling together and working up. And then you start to see this thing build again. And a currency re-evolves, sometimes under a new government, under a completely failed economy. Gold can be the standard but sometimes it's not the standard. You know, gold is only, it has no intrinsic value. I could pick up dirt, and if I could get you to trade me something for it, it's just, a, you know, it's another mineral is all it is. This one just happens to be shiny, you know? Really, there's no value to the stuff, and no, and no one just trusts gold, except that a lot of people trust gold, okay? So it won't be the medium of exchange in a failed economy, and it's a crummy, crummy, crummy investment. So don't go there. And listen to this. It's at a 176-year high right now. Is that where you buy your investments? <laughs> I try to do the old thing of, you know, buy low, sell high, instead of the other way around. But you're going to hear the gold frenzy continue because it's what people go to when they get scared. And again, the gold shooting up is not an indication of it being a wise investment. It's an indication of the fear that has run and, and racked this market and the fear that's gone to panic and then it's gone all the way over to hysteria. And I got to tell you, I'm on the radio saying, don't buy gold, it's a bad idea. And I get hate mail from people. Of course, I get hate mail for telling people to cut up credit cards. <laughs> I mean, Christian hate mail ought to be an oxymoron, y'all. <laughs> you know? It's just... I'm not complaining, it's just humorous. You know, somebody always starts out with a scripture right before they tear my head off, you know. It's, <laughs> so, you know, you, you kind of got to think this stuff through. So, again, what I'm trying to do with all of this stuff is I want you to learn to just calm down a little bit and think outside the box. Don't believe everything that's automatically put in front of you. Don't even believe everything I said tonight. Go look up John Maynard Keynes. Go look up Milton Friedman. Go look up some of these guys. Read about them. We're going to put some of it on the website later for you to see. And you can look it up for yourself if you don't like my research. You may not like the conclusions I came to. All of that's just fine with me. All I want you to do is learn to think for yourself because I think we the people are the healing agent of this economy. But we've got to think for ourselves and not be led around by our nose by somebody who's got another agenda. And I'm not going to play by their rules. Let's go back to David and see who's up next. David, who have we got next? We have next an email from Elsa in Utah. Elsa asks, here's the email, 
with the economic situation, is a good time to start my own tile business, or should I wait until the economy turns around? Wow. Well, I got to tell you, it's a tough time to start a business, particularly if you're going to go into a business that's associated with construction right now. It could be the perfect time because about the time you get it open could be the time it takes off, but I don't know exactly what that timing is going to be. And that's part of being a grown up is figuring that out for yourself in your area. Is it always a bad time to start a business when the economy is down? No, I would submit to you that it's really a good time because the weak competitors have been driven out of the market that muddy up things. And there's only the studs left. That's all that's left standing. And so you're going to have a dog fight because you're going to be fighting against the best. But at least you're going to know exactly where you stand. And let me tell you, some of the biggest and best businesses in America were started in the middle of or just following a huge calamity of some kind. Bill Gates started Microsoft in 1975 in his garage. Now, Bill's done okay. <laughs> and that's following the 73-74 major recession that we discussed earlier. Let's do an overlay on this history we're talking about. David Green, our friend from right here in, Hobby Lo uh, right here in Oklahoma City, from Hobby Lobby one of America's billionaires. <laughs> David is a friend and a, and a wonderful man. The family are just wonderful people. They are who you hope they're going to be when you meet them. They are those kind of folks. And, and David started Hobby Lobby in his garage in 1972 with $600. Now remember, 72 he started, 73, 74 was the worst recession. One of the bad three, counting this one, that we've ever had. And that's when he started it. Now, last week, Hobby Lobby gave all of their employees virtually a raise, meaning that they went to anybody that was making less than $10 an hour and raised everybody in the place to $10 an hour. Why? Because David said, I need to love my internal customers just like my external customers. And while this recession was going on, our sales went up 5%. I was 12 years old in 1972, and my dad got this really cool machine for me that would cut grass with fishing line. Because he had an idea I needed to cut some grass. It was called a weed eater. It was started by a guy named George Ballas in 1972. Weed eater sales by 1977 were $80 million in 1977 dollars. And that's before everybody and his brother started making the equivalent of a weed eater and all the knockoffs hit the market. Now George did okay and he entered the market just as we hit into that 73-74 recession. My friend S. Turek Cathy that started a company called Chick-fil-A. Another wonderful man, another wonderful family, and another wonderful company. He discovered the chicken sandwich and became the inventor of it, according to him. <laughs> and he brought it to the marketplace in the year 1946, immediately following World War II, which ended in August of 45. And the, uh, the economy and the nation was, you know, had some good economic things as a result of the war, but now she was recovering and licking her wounds. And so he started in that environment. Michael Dell started Dell Computers in his dorm room in 1984. He was 19 years old, just following the 1982 recession. So is it always a bad time? I don't know. We could ask my friend Mike. He, he's a great guy. And he said, Dave, I got to tell you, I had a Dave Ramsey moment. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I paid off my house a couple years ago, and I got $30,000 cash in the bank for my emergency fund. I hadn't any debt in years. That's why I come and hang out is just to say thank you because this stuff has turned my life around that you teach. And he said, here I sit in the middle of this recession. I've worked for this big corporation. I won't name them because he didn't give me permission to, but you would know the name, for 13 years. And one of my best friends is my boss. And he said, Dave, he came in the other day, and he walked in the door, and his lips started quivering. And his eyes filled up with tears. And he said, Mike, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've come in here, and I I got to tell you, I got to, I got to lay you off, man. And Mike said, I felt so sorry for my friend. He said, I just went around the table and I gave him a big hug. And he said, I had to do that because I was starting to grin. Because <laughs> he said, I'm completely debt free. I got $30,000 in the bank. And he said, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how big the severance is. So he got a $70,000 severance package, put that with his $30,000, and he's in business, and he'll probably outperform that company that laid him off. What do you want to bet? All right. This is America, man. I tell you, yeah. I love it.
All right, David, who's up next? We go to the phone bank, Gail from Greenwood, Indiana. Go ahead, Gail. Hi, Dave Ramsey. My husband and I are 55 years old. We both have good jobs, but presently um, we're, we're kind of slow on the retirement. Can you give us about three of the most important actions we should take to catch up over the next 10 years or so? To catch up over the next 10 years or so on retirement? Well, um, what we'll do is this. Well, I, I think there's no magic to catching up for retirement. The thing you don't want to do is, again, panic and get silly. When I do some of the dumbest decisions is when I feel a little bit desperate or scared and I think i got to make up time. And that's when you'll get conned and try to get into some kind of get-rich-quick thing that sounds too good to be true, and normally you would know it is too good to be true, but because you're pushing it a little bit trying to make up some ground, then that's the deal. So um, what we want to do is we just want to be slow and steady. I read the book The Tortoise and the Hare, and every time I read it, the tortoise wins. <laughs> anyway, how do we catch up on retirement if we're a little bit behind? Well, the way we catch up if we're a little bit behind is we go slow and steady. You work yourself out of debt because your most powerful wealth building tool is always your income. And if you can get control of your income again, you're able to go win like you've never won before. And so get rid of your debt, get your emergency fund in place, and then if you're over 50, you can super serve those Roth IRAs and that 401k. There's some provisions in the tax law that allow you to put extra amounts in. Sit down with your good mutual fund broker, your endorsed local provider. If you want to find somebody I endorse at DaveRamsey.com, you can, and they'll help you figure that out and let you play catch up a little bit in that process. All right, David, I think we got time for maybe one or two more. We, do, up? we do indeed. We're going to Mitz RN, I guess registered nurse from Dallas, Texas. There's a form. She says, I know you've said that the economy isn't all doom and gloom, but so many people I know, including my husband, are unemployed or laid off or can't find any work. Maybe it's just Dallas, Texas, but when is the unemployment job rate going to get better? Well, you know, I don't have really good news for you on that. I don't know. Again, that's an economic prediction, and the honest truth is I don't know. I told you a little bit earlier, my opinion is jobs, the jobs going down are the symptom of the economy slowing. They're not the cause. They're the symptom. And so creating jobs is not going to cause the economy to come back. Jobs are going to create as the economy comes back. In other words, when somebody goes and buys a washer and dryer again, then the washer and dryer plant's going to start making them again, and they're going to hire those people back. Okay? People start buying boats. The guys that make boats are going to show up again. That kind of thing. And so jobs are the symptom rather than the problem in this particular cycle. Now, other cycles, you could maybe discuss that. But in this case, making up jobs is not going to fix this. Jobs are going to be made up as this thing heals itself. So the bad news is if you're unemployed and you're waiting on traditional processes to bail you out of your unemployment, you're probably going to have a while, and I really wouldn't recommend waiting on that. Uh, I will tell you that unemployment has only gone up 3%. That's only gone up 3%. So most people are working, and I would suggest to you that you don't take this thing on of, ooh, the economy is the only reason that I'm unemployed. It's why you lost that job, but you've got to get your chin up again, to stick your chest out again, you know, comb that hair back, and get after it again. Now, I'm not picking on you, but I'm saying that your attitude and how you approach your job interview makes a lot of difference. And if you go in there going, well, you're not hiring anybody because of the economy, are you? <laughs> They're going to say, well, we might be, but it wouldn't be you, <laughs> Eeyore. <laughs> you know? And, and so this spirit of Eeyore is out there. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not saying that it's, that it's not normal to whine. I earlier admitted that I am a whiner when pain comes. And if you don't believe me, just ask my wife about when I get the flu. You know, I just am not a good patient. So I'm not picking on anybody that's hurting. That's not my point. But my point is this. Please, for the sake of your own family, don't wait for the economy out there, this vague thing to get better. For goodness sakes, don't wait on Washington to fix your life. Go rethink your career track. Go like this lady a little bit earlier and take a class. Let's learn something new. Let's engage in a whole different thing. Maybe the field you were in was a bad idea to start with. Maybe you already, like Mike, hated your job and are kind of glad you're not there anymore. So this is your opportunity to fly and be free. So the way I look at it is this. If you adjust the, out, the attitude of your life, you can adjust your altitude. And that's not just Pollyanna positive thinking bull stuff, okay? The truth is this. You got pushed out of the nest. You got two choices. Hit the cliff wall on the way down, 
or spread those wings, baby. Spread those wings and adjust. It may be that you are an eagle that somebody need to give a little push to because you've been acting like a buzzard. <laughs> you know, you need to get out there and spread those wings. God put you on this planet to do something. Maybe you weren't doing it. And he said, here, fly, you know. And so you, but is it scary when you jump? Yeah, it's a long way down there. Failure is a possibility. That's why I be flapping, right? <laughs> And, and so that's the thing. All right, David, one more. A little Twitter here. This is from D. Kaler from Georgia. How close are we to a cashless society? Do you see the dollar being replaced anytime soon? <sighs> no, I don't. Um, we are certainly more cashless than we've ever been because of the use of debit cards. I use a debit card. I don't use credit cards. Um, I don't play with snakes. They bite. Um, and, and, uh, but we're more, we're more and more cashless. Uh, sometimes when I hear that in a setting like this where a large portion of my audience are Christians, I also kind of hear this end times thing. Is this a sign that Jesus is coming back? And um, it could be. But I'm getting old enough, and I've been walking around in North American Christianity, that I kind of see these waves of everybody predicting the end of the world come through every so often. Anybody remember 88 reasons he's coming back back in 88? You know? And so the truth is, is the Scripture's pretty clear. It says that the day or the hour, no one knows. So I don't know. I'm not a student of eschatology of end times things. I'm not a student of that. People that know that stuff scare me. So um, I, I really don't know about that, honestly. I, I, but I'm just kind of suspicious of anybody who says they do and are predicting that it's right now because Scripture's pretty clear that we're not going to know the end of the world. And, um, and here's the deal. The Scripture's also clear that while you're here, regardless of whether the end is tomorrow or whether the end is three weeks from now or whether the end is 35 years from now or 350 years from now, the Scripture says those who plow should do so in hope. You're supposed to keep plowing while you're going. Because we don't know. It may be by the end of this row. It may be by the end of the next season. It may be by the end of that. It may be by the end of something else. We just don't know. Now, I want to close up with this. I want to give you three things to do if you're struggling with your hope out there. Three perceptions to look at. Because people are struggling with hope. It's legitimate. We've talked about it. Sometimes it's false evidence appearing real. Sometimes you've been out of a job for six months and they're foreclosing on your house and it's just real around there, man. Like the guy said a little bit earlier on David's show, it's a knife fight. You're in the middle of a knife fight and somebody else has got a gun. You know? It's just bad and it hurts. And I am not making fun of anybody in those situations. But I will tell you this, kind of like the lady that called him or emailed a while ago about unemployment down there in Dallas. The first step if you're struggling with hope is this. I want you to get up. I want you to take action. I want you to get moving. When you get moving and install yourself and inject yourself into the situation, even if what you're doing doesn't seem to make sense, you're doing something. Activity just in your body re releases proteins, endorphins, adrenaline. It changes your heart rate. You get a little bit of this stuff called sweat, which is good for you. You get moving, and you're out there, and you're just talking to everybody, and you may be driving everybody crazy, but you're not at home watching Oprah reruns. Okay? It's not a perfect formula, but you know that your best chance at success is you. And it's really your only chance. You wait on some congressman to fix your life, darling, you're going to have a long wait. Have you noticed how, how effective they are at anything? You standing at the mailbox, you're going to be standing there until you're old. All right? The president is not going to fix your life, whether he's a Republican or a Democrat. They're not, and it's not their job, even if they think it's their job. It's not their job. It's your job to fix your life. So go out there and take action. Go out there and, and, and clean that fence row and make that farm beautiful and work on, with your hand in God's glove and be that person you're supposed to be. My grandmother used to say, there's a great place to go when you're broke, to work. <laughs> and again, it's an attitude. Our endorsed local provider, Larry Williams, who is a realtor down in Houston, Texas, one of my guys was talking to Larry the other day, and he said in December of 2008, in all of his years in the real estate business, that was the worst month 
he has ever had in the real estate business. But he kept doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing. He increased his marketing budget. He made more calls. He kept working the signs. He kept working with his sellers. He kept working with the buyers. He kept working the short sales. He worked everything. And February of 2009, in the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression, Larry has had the best month of his entire life. He goes on to say, Dave, I just sold a $1.3 million home, and other homes this week are getting multiple offers. That sounds kind of weird. Is that the real estate market? Well, it is for Larry. <laughs> Something to think about. So I'm saying, not that it's a perfect formula again, but that you need to think. You need to get creative. And, and you may have been pushed out of the nest. Activity is going to be your answer. Stephen Covey says in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the number one habit of highly effective people is they're proactive. They happen to things. Everything doesn't happen to them. That's the deal. Number two step, if you're struggling with your hope, don't participate in loser talk. You get around a bunch of losers, you know what you're going to be? A loser! I'm sorry if they're in your family. <laughs> Everybody's got some. What is it the guy says? He said, God puts some people in our family just to, well, he actually gives us friends just to say, I'm sorry for your family. You know, it's, <laughs> right? But, but the truth is, if you're hanging out with losers, you're going to be one. My friend Dan Miller, who wrote the book 48 Days to the Work You Love, says that there's research out there, which is a great book on careers, by the way. There's research out there that says that your income will be within 10% of the average income of your 10 closest friends. Some of you are going, I need some new friends. <laughs> Dave, would you be my friend? <laughs> now, seriously, I mean, who you hang out with is the level you're playing at, right? And if you want to play at a higher level, don't you teach your kids that? They bring home the loser from the school and you're going, uh-uh, you ain't dating him. <laughs> You know, we're, we don't do missionary dating. You send him back to the pound, you know? Isn't that what we do? We talk to our kids about that stuff, and then as adults, we hang out with these people. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't minister to somebody that's hurting. You should, but you shouldn't involve yourself with them to the point that they begin to have influence on you. That's what I'm saying. Zig Ziglar, my friend, says, he says, I don't participate in loser talk. He says, I get up every morning, I read the Bible, I read the newspaper, so I can tell what both sides are doing. Dan Miller, I was just talking about a minute ago, has a book called No More Mondays. And in that book, No More Mondays, Dan talks about two landscapers that are right there in my neighborhood. Dan's a neighbor of mine. And he, was, he is a career coach, so he was career coaching both of these guys in the exact same situation. And this was a couple of summers ago. One landscaper had been in business for years, and he began to tell Dan about how none of the customers would pay him. All his equipment broke down all the time. It was a struggle to get good customers, and when you did, and nobody, it was a struggle to get good help. You couldn't get people to work for you. They'd steal from you. Everything was wrong, 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 wrong. This guy had the spirit of Eeyore on him. It's all bad. The world's coming to an end. And within weeks, that guy had filed bankruptcy, and the economy drove him out of business. He said, there's another landscaper I was working with. He said, Dave, this is the best year of my life. He said, I got the best customers. I got the best employees. He said, my equipment just works all the time. He said, I get people giving me stuff. They give me leads. They smile at me. They talk to me. And he said, you know why? Because he's got energy and he smiles. And he's good at what he does. I don't want Eeyore planting my bushes. Because <laughs> Eeyore might get off. He might rub off on me. I don't want to be around there. So be careful what you're taking into your mind, who you're hanging around with, what you're reading. Read some good books. There's some out there. Let me tell you, you need to read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Because America, your cheese has been moved. <laughs> it's time to look at things a little bit different. You need to think about things. Charlie Tremendous Jones, who passed away last fall, used to say that five years from today, you will be the same person you are today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. And you'll be making the same income you are today except for the books you read and the people you meet. You know, the average millionaire can't tell you who got thrown off the island.
you got to beware of loser talk because loser talk will set you up. And if you just even read a sign that's a negative sign, you will believe things that aren't true sometimes. I've got a sub shop right down the road from me there in our area. And this sub shop had the most fabulous young man working in there. He was a manager, an assistant manager. I don't know what he did exactly. His name was Jonathan. Still is Jonathan. <laughs> but Jonathan was the manager of the sub shop, and this guy was incredible. When we walk in the sub shop, as soon as I walked in the door, he'd say, Hey, Dave, you want your regular and number two without mayo or whatever? He'd call out my order. Now, I've got to admit, and I shouldn't admit this right here in front of several million people, but I have to admit, I thought maybe he knew my order because it was Dave Ramsey. <laughs> now, that, I'm ashamed to admit that because my 17-year-old son came in right behind me, and he's like, Hey, Daniel, what do you want? You want that normal turkey will you get with white and those extra pickles? And I know you like olives. And as Daniel and I sat there and ate our sub, we watched him, everybody from banker to construction worker, everybody from maid to mom who came in the door, Jonathan knew their order off the top of his head if they had ever been in there even one time. He smiled, he had energy, he came out from behind the counter, and as the leader of the organization was the guy who served the most. He bust the table, he stopped and chatted up with you. This was a sub shop. You would have thought it was a five-star restaurant, the way Jonathan took care of us. It was absolutely incredible. I never thought much about it. I just thought this is a sharp young guy. I probably ought to hire him. It did occur to me a couple times. I wished I had because I looked up a few weeks later and Jonathan, even though he was the highest producing thing around there, obviously, I don't know. Maybe they weren't taking care of him. Maybe they didn't pay him enough. Maybe they didn't cut him in on the profits and he probably was the reason for their profits. Would you agree? Say yes. yes. But I looked up one day and Jonathan had quit. And he went to school is what they told me. They told me he'd gone back to college and he, was, he, he had figured out that he needed an education to get ahead. I wish I could have caught him because he was already ahead. He just needed to apply it somewhere other than a sub shop because he had all the right stuff. But he'll be okay because he's Jonathan. Drove by there last week and there's a sign in the window. It says, closed due to the economy. <laughs> They're not closed due to the economy. They're closed because they lost their Jonathan. And they blamed it on the economy. You're probably the next Jonathan. Or maybe you've got one working for you and you need to go in tomorrow and tell him or her how good they are and how awesome a job they do and how proud you are to have them in your association. You need Jonathan's America. Jonathan's are what make America great. Jonathan's are what brought things around. But that sub shop owner closed. And I got to tell you, I hate it because the subs were good, but as a metaphorical example, it's fabulous that that place is closed because that owner apparently did not understand a treasure when he saw it in Jonathan because America's full of Jonathans. I see them everywhere I go, and that's why I know we, the people, are going to be okay. Jonathan's out there. So don't read that sign that says we closed because of the economy. They didn't close because of the economy. They closed because they lost their Jonathan. And that's how it works. Lastly is this. Third step I want you to remember if you want to get your hope back. The first one is take action. Second is don't participate in loser talk. Be a reader. Feed your brain with good stuff. And the third one is we need to learn to give again. We need to learn to give again. We talk about giving. America is the best giving nation that the world has ever known. Not our government, our people. When there is a tsunami, when there is famine, when there is anything, Americans are the ones that are on the scene with American dollars helping people. Social justice is put forth more by Americans than any other country in the history of the world, but we still need to do better because we have so much. And we need to give again. And if you're struggling with your hope, I would submit to you that if you will give extra, not of your money necessarily, but of your time, Go and maybe you're broke. Maybe you're completely unemployed and you're saying, Dave, I need to give. Well, go serve soup at the reunion mission. Go serve the homeless. Help them do some laundry down there. All of a sudden, you'll get your eyes off of your hopelessness and your hope will start to come back. You'll meet some people who have a little less hope than you, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you go over at the nursing home and you read some of those folks' a story. They need somebody to talk to them. Not enough people do. Find some way to give. We need to get back to giving because when you give, you take your eyes off of yourself and when your eyes off of yourself, you always have more hope. It always works that way. And there's a lot of us out here that are kind of griping about the government and we've been cheering and laughing about that tonight. And I've got a plan. 
and I want to invite you to join my plan. I like tea parties, and I think they were fun. Some people don't like them, and I understand that. I'm okay with that. And I'll participate in the tea parties too. But I've got a, an idea that kind of goes along beside those guys. I think that we could give, we the people, especially those of us in churches, I think if we really put our hearts, minds, and wallets to it and got our acts together, the church got its act together, the individuals within the church got their financial act together, I think we could give the government out of business. I think we the people could take over the country. Again, my friend Rabbi Daniel Lappin says this. He taught me about a Jewish ceremony on the Sabbath as the Jewish folks are getting ready to enter their work week, which they consider work to be worship. I think worship service and customer service are kind of the same thing, he says. I think that's a wonderful picture. He says they have what's called the Havdalah service. And the Havdalah service at the end of the Sabbath as we enter the work week is this. They take a saucer and a cup like this, and they pour wine in the cup to represent taking care of your own household. Evangelical Christians would say we take care of our own household first or worse than an unbeliever. That's in the Scriptures in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, they pour the, money into the, wine, they pour the wine into the cup to represent taking care of your own household first. But when it's full, they don't cease pouring. They keep to pour. And they pour and they pour and they pour until the saucer below is full to represent that you keep producing to give to others. Hope doesn't come from Washington. Hope comes from you and me. Hope comes from God. That's where it happens. Listen, don't place your hope in the wrong place. There's only one place you can place your hope that won't let you down. That's the hope-placing place. The hope-placing place was put in place before the foundations of time were laid. And it's in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. You place your hope there. If you place your hope there, that's the only one that won't let you down. It's been a joy to be with you this evening. Thank you so much, America. Go get them. I love it. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. Woo-hoo. How you guys doing? I'm good. Good to see you. What's your name? All right, good to see y'all. What's your name? Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi. What's your name? Hey, Good to meet you. Hi.